Okay, the yeah, we'll just, we'll start from the beginning. Yeah. I'll just, briefly. Yeah. There it is. I was, got, I was a week away from my 16th birthday and driving a car home in Memphis. And um, all of a sudden I had an explosion in my head. I was 15 years old. And at that time, they didn't have MRIs, they didn't have right. um, they didn't have anything. So we were on our way back to Hot Springs at the Star Trail. And by the time we got there I was blind in one eye and almost totally paralyzed. Very acute onset. Gotcha. Just went from okay to wow. very not okay. So it was unusual in the onset. They of course got strokes and you know they did all through then. They did it. it. Anyway, after being in ICU, I kept getting worse and worse. After being in ICU, my dad finally said, I want to be wherever you're calling. Quit, but, you know, you're calling people and keep dying here, and we're not doing any better. Mm -hmm. We're getting worse. What are you calling? So the best, from Mayo to wherever, they said the best neurologist uh, would, in that area would be Dennis Richards for the ANA. So that week, I was taken by ambulance to UNS. Uh, I lived on the seventh floor of the old UNS building mm -hmm. for roughly the la next two years of my high school. I was a homebound student after that. It came and went, but they kept a room for me on one private room up there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, my onset was acute pain, which is still one of my abiding problems. That started first at the base of my skull, and it's like hitting your funny bone, that nerve, mm -hmm. pain, shoots electric current through my eyes and down my spine. And it can do it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And um, at one point, they had me on so much morphine that um, I, I no longer can take morphine. It doesn't work. Right. Because it's developed a tolerance. It, to yeah, it, it doesn't work. So. Anyway, I had, and they tried every drug, they, because at that point, people were older when they were diagnosed with MS. I mean, mm -hmm. they didn't find it until they were mm -hmm. in their 30s or 40s. Right. Now, I know children are still finding it in children, but at that point, there was none that had presented like I had, and I was a class project at UNS. They would wheel me in their long excavators that just, I was a project, I mean, mm -hmm. Now, now you're a project. <laughs> well, that's okay. I, took a, I feel I'm under control. I was 15 at the time. Right. I was terrified. I was just a kid. So, you know, they would wheel me in the classroom and say, okay, watch what she does when we do this. Watch what she does when we do this. Watch what she doesn't do when we do whatever. And um, anyway, I grew up at, at the med center, basically, and um, had every kind of drug and treatment known to man and every kind of reaction bad drug reaction you can imagine, um, and had more spinal tap. One, one spinal tap in particular, the uh, resident spoke to me 11 times mm -hmm. for one tap. It was just one tap, I don't know how many had. Before I finally begged him, no, you, no more. You just got to get the oxygen. You got to get somebody in here. So at the end of all of that, um, I was pretty much feeling three parts of myself. I thought, this is no cure. I'm going to, you know, whatever. And wisely, they had every adolescent who was diagnosed with a chronic illness um, see a psychiatrist. And he told me, if uh, you ever, he said, you know what, you got two choices. You either go to Peter Brink or you stay with my mom. He sent Guy to get, he was the best psychiatrist there with us. Robert Smith. Anyway, he told me, he said, you know, the way I look at it, you've got two choices. You can either turn into, and this is the visual picture, this is what he was looking at, a big, fat, greasy-headed, pimply-faced blob in a wheelchair that was holding a butt, butt, butterfinger, butt face, everything, you know, 
while they're in a wheelchair for the rest of your life, and you can decide to get up and make money and do stuff. That's what makes me just makes me just me flat out. This yeah. is just pissed me off. And um, he said the words, the most hateful thing to me. He jump struck me, and mm-hmm. he did. My mother saw him later in life, and she said, "You saved your life." But because um, my mother and I had been up, and I mean, we were just up and leaving. We were. We may be in hot springs a day mm-hmm. and then back in the hospital for three days. Or we may be home a week and we'd be back in the hospital for that. So, um, you know, it's very tough on my parents and my mother yeah. having a teenager's like that. Well, I went to take my ACT the very last day possible on a morphine pump mm-hmm. with the IV in my foot by ambulance on morph. Now, this is on morphine to my high school by ambulance in a robe in a hospital gown and everything with the morphine going and this attendant to take my ACT. I don't know how I got even, I can't even say what I scored, but I got into college, went, in, went on through college. But I decided at that point I was going to act as if I didn't have it, period. It was my secret. I had been the sick kid in high school, you know, um, mm-hmm. I didn't have it. And that worked pretty well. I mean, I had, I had relapses, and I had to go back. But very few people knew who, that I had it. Um, Mike and I married right out of college. Um, not sure he knew exactly what he was getting in for, but he had been my best friend for years, so he was fine. Anyway, um, we had our kids, and, you know, in, um, one thing I keep going to is mentioning during my pregnancy, that I had C-sections after the birth of, I would relapse during that time. But I was pretty healthy. Um, I was pretty healthy. And I was so over UAMS, never wanted to see Dr. Lucy again. He terrified me. He and my mother were talk, but they would talk about me while I was in there. It was old enough to understand what was going on. I was pretty smart. And I'm, I mean, I knew, I knew what they were talking about, but they were talking about me and not to me. And, um, Mike found 